Uh, and he worked as, a, I mean, maybe TA uh, in charge of these sections. And uh, I guess today he, he, he would like to talk some basic concept, maybe uh, used uh, for the lectures. So, Jason, welcome. Okay, great. Uh, all right, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I would like to uh, share my screen. Um, if you could, uh, uh, if someone could allow me to do that, that would be great. Okay. Oh yeah. So Rich, maybe you, you need to, to... to permit him to, to share the okay. screen. I got it. You got it. Um, just a few words while I um, install this uh, plugin. Um, I asked, um, um, excuse me, I can't do two things at once, sorry. Um, I asked Gabe uh, what, what uh, he expects the students to know before um the start of this course and he told me the following is it better if i go sideways yeah i think maybe this is better um so he wrote me back with the following uh five topics um transitive models measurable cardinals reflection arguments uh, constructability and or no definability so um as you can see these are pretty uh simple and normal topics, nothing too involved. Um, and well, I mean, by nature, large kinds beyond choice is a very um, uh, self-contained topic. So what I'm going to do today is just to um, go over these prerequisites to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, the expectation, um, well, I mean, going over this document is that you've uh, seen most of this stuff at least once. Um, the purpose of this document is more to organize them, to put, in, to put them in the same place so that you have a nice document to uh, refer to later down the road. Um, I might share this with uh, Professor Howe as well um, so he could uh, distribute it among some sort of mailing list. Okay. Um, so we'll see how far we get. Um, I will mostly just skim over both of these uh, since they're uh, quite um, basic knowledge, so to speak. But uh, the first thing Gabe wants us to know is um, facts about transitive models. Again, transitive models are well, just what it says. It's a set with some structure. Well, I mean, it's the set with a membership relation such that the, trans, uh, such that the set is transitive. Right, meaning that um, you could see all its members, right? So X in M implies X is a subset of M. Right, this ensures that judgment about membership is correct in some sense. Like you could see all the way down uh, the membership chain in your members. Okay. Um, so um, one remark is um, you typically get transitive models in a few ways. Right, you could either assume that it exists, right? In 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 forcing arguments, for example, you go like um, you know let M be a countable transit model, and then you do this and that forcing argument on it. Uh, it also follows from large cardinals, so we know, for example, uh, if there exists um, an inaccessible kappa then V kappa satisfies DFC. And you know that V kappa is transitive, so that's a transitive model. And if you take an elementary substructure, right, countable, uncountable, what have you, right, you're gonna have a well-founded structure uh, that also satisfies DFC. But then, um, but I'm gonna to get to Mostovsky collapse later. So when you have a well-founded model that is just as good as having a transitive model. Okay. You could also build it up by going from the ground up, um, in which case you get a transitive proper class from the point of view of where you are building it. 
So um, L hard L of R, L of X, so hard of something. These uh, inner models also transitive models. Um, you could also get it by forcing, you know, start with one transitive model, get another, okay? Um, a key tool of um, um, getting transitive models is this uh, theorem Mostovsky collapse, which says, um, well, you know, to, to a trans the, the the membership relation on the on the transit model is the real membership relation, right? It doesn't have to be, uh, as long as you have a uh, set uh, with some relation um, that's that's extensional, well founded, and set like, uh, then you could collapse it uh, into an isomorphic structure uh, with a real membership relation that is transitive. So getting a well-founded structure, uh, it's just as good as getting a transitive structure uh, or model. Okay, and then some stuff about being, uh, about absoluteness. Um, right, absolute, um, a formula is absolute, just in case its truth is invariant across uh, the intended structures to the, the two relevant structures, right? In this case, we are um, implicitly saying between M and V, right? Um, so um, this means that the, the, the transitive structure uh, M uh, is getting certain truths correctly, right? What are those truths? Well, the delta zero formulas and also the delta ones um and as usual sigma one formulas uh are the truth of sigma one formulas are preserved upwards right? and uh the truth of uh truths of pi one formulas are preserved downward um if you are seeing this for the first time um or or if you need a refresher on the proof it's the idea is roughly this so um, why do, for example, um, truths of sigma one formulas go up, right? If you have a formula looking like this and the truth of this is unchanged going up and down, then um, if M thinks this is true, then uh, let some C in M witness that, but then um, M is a subset of V, so C goes into B as well. So V thinks that there exists some X, namely this C right here that satisfies this formula. Um, right, this last bit is by noticing that phi X is a delta zero formula. So the truth of that goes up and down. Okay. Okay. Um, now this um, is a relatively involved fact well, compared to what we've seen uh, just now, um, and that is um, the transitive models uh, are determined by uh, sets of ordinals, right? Um, and to spell it out is if you have two uh, transitive models, right, and they have the same uh, um, ordinals, they're of the same height, Right, and um, such that for every, whoops, sorry, for every ordinal in them, they see the same sets, they see the same power set of that ordinal. So uh, 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 the, the short form of this assumption is to say that they have the same sets of ordinals. Okay, and as long as one of them satisfies choice, then uh, they are equal. Okay, so identity on two transitive models is very um, cheap in this sense. Um, all you need to do is for them to have the same sets of ordinals. Okay. Um, and to prove this is not very difficult. Um, um, so it's a typo here. Um, this is to notice that um, this is by the fact that um, every set can be uh, represented 
as a uh, I guess as a subset of an ordinal. This is using AC. Right. And the reason is that uh, say you have a set X, right? Then by AC, you could well order it, uh, right? Namely, you can get a function mapping it to uh, some kappa, right? And if you look at X, um, actually, you have to look at the transitive closure of uh, X, right? Along with its membership relation. And then this F, right, induces a uh, an isomorphism on this kappa with some relation E, where the relation E is defined. Let me see why I did this here. Um, okay, and you can do this in a way that's absolute using um, Godel's pairing function. Um, um, okay. So now to, to, to get the proof done formally, uh, where you have to start with is by noticing um, when two models have the same, have the same sets of ordinals, then they also have the same sets of, uh, I mean, it's the same pairs of ordinals. Uh, I mean, sets of pairs of ordinals. Um, what this is really saying is they have the same relations on ordinal. All right, if you think about the ordinal alpha, and you think about uh, what kinds of real, what kinds of structure you could place on alpha, right? Having same, the same subsets for alpha implies that uh, the two models can only imply the same structure, same kinds of structures on alpha. Okay, and and then and then you carry out this AC argument to get one direction. Okay. Uh, using you know whichever model you assume to have AC, for instance M. Um, okay, um, and the other direction, you know, getting the one without AC to be a subset of the one with AC, um, you basically just decode this relation, right? You need AC to get this relation, right? This get this isomorphism, um, but once this so once this uh, relation on this ordinal is there to decode it, you don't need AC, right? You just do this inductively. You just read off, um, which is what I've written here. Okay. Um, all right. Um, I'll send. I'll share this document with you um, so that you could revisit some of the arguments. That I skipped over. Okay, so uh, up next we got um, measurable cardinals. Um, so the notion of measurable cardinals um, is derived from the notion of a filter. Um, it was actually uh, so. This is a fun fact. It was actually invented by um, uh, Ulam, who also invented the uh, atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb. So um, I, I think this was in uh, Defending the Axioms 2 by Penelope Maddy, She says, the voice of caution reminds us that these things are, are invented by the same people they invented the hydrogen bombs. But anyways, so uh, definition of a filter. Um, the intuition here is um, you want a notion of largeness, right? A filter is really a notion of measuring stuff, right? It's a notion of a measure. Um, so the whole space is large, empty set is not large. Um, if you take two large sets, right, and you look at what they have in common, then, well, they are, uh, what they overlap is also large. Um, so um, let me see. So you have a large set and you have a set that's even, oops, sorry, this should be, a here, right? If you have a large set and you, you have a set that's superset, namely larger than the large set, then that superset is also large. Okay. Um, and the filter is ultra, just in case um, every set, every subset of the space is either large 
or um, it's complemented. Okay, so it 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 it's, it induces a total measure. So um, I'm not very good with category theory, so let me try my best. So from a uh, filter U, you could somehow um, induce a measure uh, on the set X to zero one, namely you um so the two value measure namely you map the sets in u to one saying that it's large okay um all right um now in the context of this course um this uh notion of a filter is usually applied to ordinals and cardinals um and we also sometimes will like to track where um, the filter itself is on the von Neumann hierarchy as an object, right? So um, if you've got a filter on some cardinal kappa, then it's a collection of subsets of kappa, right? It's a collection of the large sets, which means it's a subset of uh, uh, P kappa. So it's in uh, the power set of power set of kappa. So given a filter on kappa, um, this filter is gonna appear as a member in V kappa plus two, right? Because you take power set twice. Okay, and then um, what do we do with the filter? We use it to build ultra powers. Um, I believe most of you have seen this now, um, but okay, non-principle. Um, just in case you don't think uh, the single point set, the singletons are large. Um, and uh, kappa complete, just in case it's um, kappa additive as a measure. So if you have um, less than kappa many sets, all large, and you take intersection, right, then the intersection is also large. All right, um, so completeness and non principle. Okay, um, so with um, when you when you have a filter, um, you could build what's called an ultra power. Uh, an ultra power is just um, a quotient structure where you look at uh, basically the so start with the structure M, you look at uh, strings of elements of M um, of length kappa. So basically, if M looks like this, right, then you're really looking at uh, really kappa many copies of M. Right, each element will look like this. So it's basically a choice function. Right, um, so these, uh, the domain consists of functions from kappa to M. Right, and then on, on these functions, you could define uh, equality and uh, membership, right? Uh, and this is defined uh, in the obvious way, uh, defining uh, two elements F and G are equal, just in case they are almost everywhere equal. By almost everywhere, I mean the points, the indices, right, in which uh, the two functions coincide uh, is a large set from the point of view of, 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 of you. Right. And similarly, uh, a function is um, the element of another function, just in case, right, you do point-wise comparison between, okay, this is F, this is G, you ask, well, how are they related in the membership relation? Right. The answer is yes, almost everywhere in the sense of you, then you declare that F is a member of G, right? And on this uh, space of functions, um, you define a equivalence, uh, an equivalence relation. Uh, basically by saying that two functions are the same, just in case uh, they are this, almost everywhere the same. Um, Sorry, I circled the wrong thing. So here, um, and you have to uh, do a little bit of uh, this thing called Scott trick by this underlying stuff. Um, this just makes sure that the domain is, uh, this just makes sure that these uh, equivalence classes are sets, 
right? You're picking the uh, the ones with the lowest rank. So this ensures that at the next level, the alpha plus one, uh, these things become sets. Okay. And an ultra power is basically just this quotient, uh, right? The, the ultra power of M by U is just um, uh, the space of functions, but uh, divided by this um, equivalence relation. Okay. Um, now, most of the time, we'll be interested in the case, the special case where um, M is just the uh, von Neumann universe V. Right, so we're just taking ultra powers over the entire universe V. Right, we write, um, I mean, depending on who you read, um, sometimes people use alt to say the ultra power. Sometimes people write the ultra power of V by U in this way. Um, and you also must obviously collapse it into a transitive structure when it's well-founded. Okay, so some uh, standard facts. Uh, when you take um, uh, the ultra power of V by an, by an ultra filter. So if, if the ultra filter you're doing the uh, ultra power construction with is kappa complete, non-principal and ultra, right? Then the result that you get uh, is set like and well-founded. Mm, an extensional, which means by our previous fact, you could collapse it into a transitive structure. Right? Um, this is typically written as M in the uh, literature. Yeah. So sometimes people write alt uh, when they refer to the uh, isomorphic structure that is transitive. Um, so this does very little harm. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that as well. Um, and also by Walsh's theorem, uh, the ultra power is elementarily equivalent to V. Um, they have the same theory. Um, this is just a straightforward uh, uh, consequence of Walsh's theorem on ultra product. OK, uh, moving on. Um, Elementary embedding between um, two structures is just um, an embedding that preserves uh, first order truths with parameters. Okay. Mm. You take something from the domain, you map it over to the range, um, and the two structures agree on all formulas involving these uh, things that are moved. Okay. Um, so uh, we had we started with V. Uh, we took an ultra power uh, with a uh, kappa complete non-principal ultra filter um, to get the ultra power. So now we could define a an elementary embedding by um, mapping every element to the constant function that maps everything to. Um, to it. So uh, the constant function of A is just the map that, uh, that goes from kappa to V such that um, every point is mapped to the same thing. It's a constant function. Okay. Um, so when you map it like this, um, you actually get an, el an elementary embedding. Um, and the reason is pretty simple, and this uses Washer theorem. Right, so take an element from the domain, right, V, um, and by Walsh's theorem, um, uh, you know, given a formula phi, uh, V is true. Uh, I, I mean, I, I mean, V thinks that phi A is true, just in case, right, um, V thinks this constant function mapping everything to A. Um, when applied of this ind uh, index i, uh, uh, whatever the result is, is true of phi, which is basically what this says, right? It's just phi a, because this is a constant function. So this is actually just kappa, right? Because v thinks phi a is true, and c a of uh, uh, i maps to a for every i less than kappa, right? So uh, the whole space is large. So kappa is in U, but then this is the case just in case the um, 
ultra power thinks that uh, phi of C A is true. Right, and just and 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 this will define it to be what J A is. Okay. Um, and now um, a typical template of getting large kernels, you know, uh, uh, when 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 you get to measurable and things beyond, is by considering critical points. Um, the critical point of an elementary embedding um, is just the least ordinal moved by J. Um, I should remark uh, for maybe the more advanced students is, um, um, so one remark I would like to make for the, uh, maybe the more advanced student is that the existence of this, um, where do I write it? Okay, uh, needs AC to guarantee existence. You need, um, so with the axiom of choice, you could prove um, that if um, if J moves anything at all, it's going to move an ordinal, right? Whereas without the axiom of choice, there's a counterexample. I mean, there are many, but uh, there's a counterexample in the uh, doctoral dissertation of um, Andres Caicedo, um, which um, where he defined an elementary structure in the fourth, I mean, where you defined an elementary embedding from L of R to a different L of R in the forcing extension uh, that moves um, some set, but it is the identity on all the ordinals. So um, if you have time, we uh, could get to it. It's a pretty fun example. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So, um, a stronger kind of, so I mean, maybe I should say a better kind of uh, uh, ultra filter is normal ultra filters. Um, my way of thinking uh, is just an ultra filter is normal just in case the identity function on kappa represents kappa in the ultra power. Um, this is arguably the most versatile way of um, defining it so that you could use it in arguments. But yeah, so normal, um, why do we care about normal ultra filters? Because um, as soon as you have any non-trivial elementary embedding right, on some critical point kappa, uh, from this embedding, you could uh, define a, uh, a collection of subsets. Sorry, so this is a collection of subsets um, P kappa. Um, by declaring a subset of kappa to be large, just in case kappa is in the image of that set. Um, and you could show that uh, this set is going to be uh, a kappa complete non principal ultra filter on kappa. So that means kappa is a measurable kernel. Um, and in addition, it is normal. Right. And sometimes in the literature, this is called the normal measure derived from J, or sometimes just the derived measure. Um, right. When 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 it's def when it's derived from this definition here. All right. Mm. And um, there is are some nice structural relations between V and M when there's an elementary embedding. Um, and that might tell us something about, you know, the ultra filter or kappa. Um, so the basic stuff, um, so J restricted to V kappa is just the identity. So it doesn't move anything. And so here, you know, if you look at V kappa, um, and you look at the range, these are all fixed, right? These are the identity below V kappa. Okay. Um, and um, if J is the uh, ultra, ultra power embedding from the ultra filter U on kappa, then kappa is going to be the least cardinal that's moved and uh, it's going to be moved up. So the picture here is this. Uh, so say kappa is here. So it jumps to J kappa. Okay, um, 
So it's a first place where uh, sort of jumps. Um, and then kappa is um, inaccessible. So measurable cardinals is a kind of large cardinals. And we'll see that it's, it cannot be the first inaccessible when we come to uh, reflection arguments. OK. Um, and the agreement extends a little bit further. Um, so not only do you have n, m, n, and v uh, agreeing on v kappa, but because j is the identity, you also get um, the next level of agreement as well. Uh, and this is because, um, OK, so uh, this is actually, so kappa plus uh, in v is kappa plus in m is actually a consequence of the first clause. And this is actually a consequence from the following. So for x subset of v kappa, j of x intersect of v kappa is just x. Okay, this follows from this, um, which is not very hard to prove. Um, no, but just noticing that everything below v kappa is fixed. It is, is, is mapped by, by j as the identity function. Okay, and then some cardinal arithmetic stuff. So two to the kappa uh, is bounded by two to the kappa in the sense of m, right, which is strictly bounded by, right, so it's strictly below j kappa. And this is strictly below two to the kappa, uh, the successor of two to the kappa in the sense of v. Um, this last bit, you have to get, you have to prove uh, by analyzing how many functions there can be to uh, represent uh, J kappa. Um, so this is slightly involved, but not very hard. This is in uh, YEC uh, 17.9 lemma. Oh, I wrote it here, yeah. Lemma 17.9 index um, set theory. Okay, and then you also have um, where continuity points are and discontinuity points are. Uh, which is a very nice characterization of J. Um, so when you have a limit ordinal uh, and uh, lambda whose cofinality is not kappa, it's not the critical point, then it is a continuity point. Uh, the soup, uh, I mean, J lambda is just a soup of the things uh, below lambda. I mean, soup of the J alphas for the alphas below lambda. So it's a sort of continuity point. And when you have a uh, cofinality kappa, right, it's a discontinuity point, it jumps. Right? So J lambda gets mapped above the uh, soup of things below it. Okay, and, 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 and this is, um, I suppose, kind of important um, when you come to uh, large cardinals beyond choice, you, you use a lot of these uh, fixed point arguments uh, saying that, okay, some, some uh, elementary embedding must fix a certain uh, uh, kind of ordinal, or you define the, an ordinal to be something like a soup of something. And then you argue that uh, this must be a fixed point by the uh, elementary embedding. So this is an instance of that. So if you have a strong limit cardinal, with cofinality not equal to um, kappa, then this is a fixed point. So, and notice this means, um, so there is a proper class of fixed points of J. Okay. Um, and M is closed under kappa sequences, um, and, but it's not closed when it's the ultra power uh, when it's the uh, collapse of the ultra power, it's not co closed under kappa plus sequence. All right, so, so the best that you can have is to have it closed under kappa sequences. So take any, this means, so this notation means uh, for all f, which is a function from kappa to m, uh, f is in m actually. Oops. Okay. And the ultra filter giving you the uh, embedding is actually also not in M. Okay, all of these could be found in you know your favorite textbook in set theory, um, Yak, for example, um, Kanamori, and also um, Ralph Schindler's uh, relatively new textbook also. Um, so if you look at these, um, maybe these two points, you actually get this really nice corollary. 
which says if you have an ultra power embedding to J going from V to M, right, then M cannot be V, right? The reason is, well, U is in V, but U is not in M. And also uh, V is closed under kappa plus sequences because, well, it's everything, right? So, um, but M is not. So it's, um, you could think of it as some sort of clue or precursor to Kuhnan's theorem that there can be no elementary embedding V to V whatsoever. But this is the special case where J is the ultra power embedding. Okay, um, so something that uh, uh, Gabe wants you to know is uh, reflection. Um, so um, I think, so reflection is just a way of using these embeddings and these uh, filters um, to extract information about kappa and V kappa. Right, a very simple example. Um, suppose you have a measurable cardinal kappa um, then it cannot be the uh, um, it cannot be the first inaccessible. There must be an accessible below kappa. And this was actually a very major open problem back when uh, measurable cardinals were just invented, and it was solved by I think Tarski uh, and 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 his colleagues using a very different method. I think in uh, infinitary languages, that kind of stuff. I I don't I don't know the proof of that, but when you have the language of elementary embedding, this is very easy. I right, just take this uh, elementary embedding right, with critical point kappa. Um, so we know from a fact before that kappa is inaccessible in V, right? But then uh, inaccessibility can be expressed in term in, in using a pi one formula. So the truth of that carries downward. So M thinks actually kappa is also inaccessible. So this means that M is gonna think, you know, oh, below J kappa, there is an inaccessible. But then J is an elementary embedding. Um, so you could pull this back to V, right? Remember, uh, uh, elementary embedding tells you that whatever uh, you know, v thinks phi a is true of uh, that is is found only if m thinks uh, phi of j a is true, right? Uh, so by elementary, so you this is what I mean by pulling this fact back to v. You get uh, v thinks there is actually an inaccessible below kappa. Okay. So you could generalize this um, to show that there are two, three, four, or mega many uh, inaccessible cardinals below kappa, basically by just running this argument many times, uh, if you will. Um, to generalize this a little bit, um, you could have um, actually a measure one set of inaccessibles um, uh, below kappa, right? And this theorem 21, um, when you have a, an elementary embedding going from V to M with a uh, critical point kappa. Um, and you have the normal measure derived from J. Then uh, from the point of view of, of, of that normal measure U, almost every cardinal below kappa is inaccessible. But how do you prove this? Um, so we start by noticing um, whether kappa is inaccessible or not could be seen in V kappa plus one, right? And this follows from the definition of inaccessibility, right? If, 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 it's, if it's singular, then all the ingredients of building that uh, singularizing function, namely the function witnessing that singular is a subset, is already available in V kappa. So by taking power set, that's gonna become available in V kappa plus one. Similarly for a uh, strong limit. So, um, so what the inaccessibility of kappa is something that you only need to check uh, to confirm or deny by looking at uh, v kappa. But we just uh, saw that uh, v and m agree on what v kappa is. So if um, uh, m thinks kappa is in so so um, so when kappa is inaccessible in v, 
this fact carries over by virtue of these two structures having the same V kappa plus one, uh, carries over to M. And you look at, um, you know, writing, for example, I for the set of inaccessibles below kappa. Um, then this, it follows that uh, kappa is actually an inaccessible below J kappa. This means that kappa is in JFI, right? Because I is defined uh, in this way, All right? So J of I is just defined by applying J to the uh, parameters in the definition, okay? And by definition of the derived measure, I is in U, which is what we wanted to prove. Okay, so these are sort of typical examples of what's called uh, reflection arguments. Um, you're gonna see uh, really fancy variants uh, of this definition of what it means to reflect something uh, in 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 the uh, uh, in the in the actual lessons. Okay, now I'm gonna skip uh, theorem twenty two, which is uh, just another example showing um, how we can use uh, reflection arguments. Okay, so um, constructability, um, so L stuff. Um, so just to remind you, um, L is built like V is built. You start with the empty set. At successor stages, you take a special kind of power set, namely the definable power set, whose definition is over here. Um, basically, you just look at elements of L alpha and you ask, oh, well, if you know, I'm using first order logic in the language of set theory, what sets can I define this way? You collect all those and then you get L alpha plus one, uh, limit stages, collect. And then, um, so X is in L just in case uh, there exists one of these alphas where X is in L alpha. Okay. Um, I will come at Alexa, so. Um, oh, there is nothing for me to resume. <laughs> okay, so um, you could also similarly um, in the process of defining L, um, uh, cheat a little and borrow information from some additional set X. All right, so you get relative constructability. Um, it's the same definition, except at successor stages, you consider um, the definable subsets of L alpha, but uh, you now try to look at things that you can define with um, X as some sort of oracle, or with this X as some sort of oracle. And you can ask, well, is this set in X? Is this set not in X? Okay. Uh, standard facts of L, um, it's a very nice structure. It satisfies AC and GCH. Um, and it in general, L of X has a well ordering of the universe, uh, which you could write down using a formula involving X. Um, and L is the minimal in the model in the sense that it's a subset of any in the model. Um, it's the minimal in the model that can see X. Okay. So once you have, once you can see X, you can actually build L of X in any in the model. Right. Another way is, uh, of getting uh, of playing with constructability is to start not with the empty set, but with the transitive closure of a set that you like. So when you do that, you get uh, a model of CF. Now you also get, um, so, so the model that you get in this way, L of X, is the smallest in the model that has X as a member. Um, and unlike L of, so with these L of X's, you could always, assume that they satisfy uh, the whole of DFC, so AC included. But with these um, L of X's, right, uh, curly brackets, you can only uh, get that they satisfy CF. Right, a very typical example is L of R. At the first stage, you dump all the reals in there. So you get all the real numbers at the first stage. Um, so when you're forced to add um, omega-1 current reals, this structure is not going to satisfy the axiom of choice. And this is actually uh, coming from the same counterexample of the uh, elementary, uh, elementary embedding and critical point example. Okay. So um, 
how are these related? Um, there's this famous theorem by Scott, uh, which says, well, if you have a measurable cardinal, then V is not L. All right, why is this? Well, if you have uh, a measurable cardinal, let kappa be the least one, um, and you build the ultra power embedding, right? And um, so now um, V is gonna think that kappa is the least measurable cardinal. And shooting it over to M, M is gonna think that J kappa is the minimal, the least measurable cardinal. Yeah, but then we know that J kappa is a critical point. I mean, kappa is a critical point. Right, I'm putting things together. This is where V equals L comes, in, comes into work. Um, so, if V equals L, then uh, right, then then uh, there's only one in the model, right? Namely the smallest one. So then M equals V equals L. So this is a contradiction here, right? Because right, because this is just V now. You can think that kappa and J kappa, which we know is different, be both the smallest measurable kind. Okay, um, all right, um, ordinal definability, um, right? Something is ordinal definable, just in case you could define it with ordinal parameter, okay? So you have, just in case you have some formula um, and you could find some ordinals such that uh, what it means to be in X is de defined by this formula here. Now, this is not formalizable, uh, because of Tarski's theorem, uh, truth in the universe is not uh, definable. But uh, so to get around that formally, we just uh, use uh, um, reflection to say that, well, just in case this definition holds in some V beta that's guaranteed to exist in the, uh, by, by, by the uh, reflection theorem. Okay. But in practice, you always think the, uh, this definition here. Right, so um, something's hereditarily or no definable, just in case um, it's uh, or no definable and its member is, and the member of its member is also, and the member is member, so on and so forth. So it, the transitive closure of that set is or no definable. All right, so hot is the class of hereditarily or no definable sets. Just like L, um, hot could be relativized to a um, set. I'm following the uh, notation from Schindler's. So um, relativized or no definability very, um, has very different um, notations across the literature. So I'm, I'm, I'm just sticking with one. Uh, you might see a different one uh, later down the road. Um, okay, again, sa same thing. Something is, uh, um, sorry, this should be ODZ. Right, uh, some set is ordinal definable from Z just in case it's ordinal definable with some elements of Z as a parameter. And it's hereditarily so just in case uh, it's transitive closure is also ODC. Okay, so these hot uh, models are nice in the models of ZF. And whenever um, the, you know, the, the, whenever Z is defi ordinal definable, from Z, all right? Then, uh, all right, so uh, uh, then hot of Z satisfies Z. Okay. Um, there is also a definable well ordering of the universe in hot. And in fact, any such model, if N is an inner model with such uh, a definable well ordering, then it's gonna be included in hot. Um, and the proof of that is kind of straightforward. So informally, what you do is you, you, you take that while ordering and you say, okay, this is the, the first uh, element in that ordering, the second, the third, and all the way through all the ordinals. All of these are um, ordinal definable expressions, right? So these are using ordinal parameters. So that's how you do that proof. Okay. Um, 
let me maybe say, uh, so we have 10 minutes. We're almost at the end. Uh, let me say this first. Um, one way to oh, make- Jesse, sorry. Yeah. I, I think uh, you, you need not to be in the, exactly at the team, I, I think. I mean- oh, Okay, yeah, yeah. You could not, you need not to take hurry because just okay. uh, in the before 12 is okay. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, good, thank you. Um, let me see, um, typo here. Um, let me bracket fact 35. Um, I'm gonna return it uh, towards the end, but I want to uh, do this um, coding, this notion of coding into the continuum pattern first, since um, this is, uh, mentioned a lot in the forcing literature, uh, and you might see it um, when you say, oh, code this into the continuum pattern. Um, so sometimes in literature, you see, you know, given you, you, you're you going to have some set, and then the, the author is going to go, oh, yeah, we're going to force to code this into the continuum pattern. So definition 36 is what this means. Okay, so um, recall that um, sets, um, or transitive closures of sets along with the membership relation, right? Under the axiom of choice could be mapped onto some sort of um, some ordinal with some relation, right? So um, if X is a set, um, then you could always by AC find uh, an ordinal delta X and some relation on that ordinal such that delta when imposed with that relation is isomorphic to the transitive closure of X under the membership, under the real membership relation. Um, and um, when you have, um, so basically coding into the continuum pattern refers to the following fact. You could control, um, you could, we know by uh, Easton's result, you could control uh, at least X successor stages, um, whether the continuum hypothesis at that stage holds or not. Okay. By continuum hypothesis at that stage, I mean, whether, you know, two to the Alice alpha is, uh, Aleph alpha plus one, you know, whether this holds, right? If you think about the, um, you know, the indicator function, if you will, uh, if yes, I write a one, if no, I write a zero. All right, so you could think of whether the continuum hypothesis holds at a certain stage as giving you a function, a binary function from one nodes to zero one, All right? Um, Okay, and um, so we say that a set is coded into the continuum pattern when um, this set, when you look at the uh, continuum pattern, it serves by, you, by looking at it this way, it serves as the characteristic function of some subset of Lambda. And that subset by Gödel's pairing function, right, or the inverse of that, is actually a subset of a relation on lambda. Right. So we say that the set X is coded into the continuum pattern, just in case that there are some alpha lambda where this happens. Right. Um, right. When you look at starting from, so you look at starting from. Aleph alpha all the way to some, I don't know, Aleph alpha plus something. And you look at the character, you look at the truth of the continuum hypothesis along this interval. That's gonna give you a function going from, uh, I'm going from, let's say this is alpha plus, uh, beta for sufficiently large beta. 
And this is going to give you some uh, characteristic function from beta to say 0, 1. Okay, so this identifies a subset of beta. Right, and, and, and when you uh, decode this subset of beta into a relation on beta, and that's going to give you, well, if X is coded into the continuum pattern here, that's going to give you a structure that's isomorphic to X or the transitive closure of X. So this is what it means when people say, you know, code a set into the continuum pattern. Um, so as an application, um, right, this is um, an application of uh, separating L and hot. Um, so you, namely there is a forcing extension over L such that um, when you extend, um, you're gonna have L different than hot. Okay, so here's my very sketchy proof. Um, the first step, you go from L to a coron real, uh, to add a coron real to get LC. So here, right? And then the next step is to argue that um, in LC, we have the coron real is not ordinal definable. Um, and this you use the homogeneity, the, the, the weak homogeneity of co enforcing. Namely, um, if um, P forces some facts with um, uh, ground model parameters, then the weakest condition one already, fo already forces that. So the argument is if, well, if C could be ordinal defined in the extension, then by homogeneity, actually we could define it using the forcing relation. And we know the forcing relation is definable in the ground model. Then that will mean that, you, oops, sorry. then it will mean that uh, you could, L could define C as well. But then we know that this is impossible because you know, the current real C is not in L. Okay. Um, so we are here um, in the Cohen extension L of C, um, L is equal to hot. Um, now, um, but then what, what we do is now working in, in, in L of X, uh, I mean L of C. Um, for I in, this should be omega, I beg a pardon. Um, for I in omega, you're gonna use Easton's forcing to make the continuum hypothesis true or false according to whether I is in C. Now you could do that because um, we're working in L of C and C is, uh, you could uh, use C as a parameter in defining the forcing notion. Right, so um, in the extension by Eason's theorem, right, you get that um, two to the aleph i is equal to two to the aleph i plus one, namely the continuum hypothesis at this step is true, if and only if i is in C, right? So you basically you know, look at what C, what the, the characteristic function of C is, and you go, okay, I'm gonna turn that into the truth and falsity of the continuum hypothesis below Aleph Omega. So when you get to this uh, final extension, um, the current real C, which was not ordinal definable in L, uh, I mean, which, which was not ordinal definable in L of C, is now suddenly ordinal definable in L of C of G. Right, you just say something like, oh, it's the unique real number whose characteristic function behaves the same way as the truth of the continuum hypothesis below Aleph Omega, as the continuum pattern below Aleph Omega. Now, and by definition, this extension, right, if you run this definition, I mean, if you run the definition in the final extension L of C of G, that's going to define the current real C for you. All right, so in the extension, uh, so L is not hot. 
Okay, so this is an example of how to make things ordinal definable. Okay, and this more or less the go to trick by coding it into some kind of pattern. Uh, and the default is the continuum pattern, but you could also do this on other patterns as well, like the diamond pattern. Uh, I don't know if you could do it with the uh, squares, uh, probably can with some large cardinals. Okay, um, this theorem 39 um, is just a, a, a fun fact, I suppose. Um, so when we define hard, we defined it using some sort of a, a ground up uh, from top down fashion, right? You look at the entire universe and you ask, okay, what sets can I sort of uh, carve out by defining this notion of ordinal definability. Um, there is a different characterization of hard, which builds it from the empty set moving up. So like how you built L um, and that is by replacing the successor stage of L with this second order definable power set. I start with the empty set, keep taking second order definable. So definable subsets in second order logic this time. Um, and you keep running this operation through the ordinals taking um, unions at the limit stages. Um, that's going to give you hard. So this result is due to um, Scott and Myhill. In the same paper, they uh, where they formalized the notion of ordinal definability. So um, Gödel mentioned this notion of ordinal definability as some sort of vague informal notion in 1946 if I remember correctly. Um, and then he said, okay, maybe somebody could, could come up with uh, a, a, a formalizable definition of what it means to be ordinal definable. So Scott and Michael did that. They also proved that it's just second order L. Um, and this, the use of AC is necessary. Um, there was a paper by, uh, I think in the eighties by two Polish researchers um, whose names I don't remember now. Um, showing that there is, um, so there is uh, a symmetric extension. Mm. And uh, I think the forcing they use was a combination of um, Easton's forcing and then something else. Um, and then they take a symmetric extension n, where n thinks that hot is not equal to, um, uh, I don't know, L2. You know what I mean? So this is the second order L here. So the use of AC is necessary is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Now, um, okay, one last bit. Um, I wanted to show you a way of extracting structure uh, so we've seen how to make things into hot, right? By coding it into some pattern to make it ordinal definable. And I want to show you an example of how to extract structural information uh, of hot um, uh, or hot of R in this case um, by looking at the universe. Okay, so this is um, fact uh, 35. Um, this says we could define a relation we could write down a formula in the language of set theory at d x y is z <clears throat> d x y equals z just in case um right d alpha of a equals b holds just in case alpha is a code of finite sequences of ordinals right, the first one is a natural number coding a formula uh and along with the rest of that sequences and, sorry, and A as parameters defines Y. All right, basically, uh, so if the first element of alpha is the code of phi, then uh, B alpha A equals B just says um, phi, uh, alpha, whatever's left, and A uh, ordinal defines uh, B. So 
the point is when no definability is formalizable in the language just set here. So uh, with this predicate, we could uh, show that, for instance, um, uh, this is due to Soloway, um, that hot of R, so um, right, uh, anything that's ordinal, uh, definable, hereditarily definable from an ordinal and a real number. But when you have, uh, when you look at that in a model, that's going to satisfy BC. Now, I said earlier that there's no guarantee that these models will have uh, any choice principles at all. So in this case, um, hot of R is pretty nice in that it has DC. Um, and the proof should start here. Um, the point is, right, we, we, uh, well, we set things up, uh, let A be a set that's not empty and let R be a relation that's on this set, uh, not some set, on this A that we picked, by satisfying the assumption of dependent choice. And what we do now is we could um, inductively define a function, a, 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 um, a dependent choice function, if you will, uh, in V. Um, by taking, we know that A is non-empty. So we let F0 be that, uh, be some element of A. Now you could do that because you're only making choice uh, once. Um, and then you let, um, let me see, this is D, sorry. Um, you let alpha zero right, be the least ordinal such that there is a real number X such that you have uh, F0. Um, I mean, such that, uh, 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 you know, uh, alpha zero with X ordinal defines F0. Uh, um, this can be done because F0 takes range in hot of R. Um, and we know that everything in hot of R is definable from uh, ordinals and reals. Okay, and you take um, X zero, right, to be some uh, witness of that. Um, okay, and you keep doing this uh, uh, omega many steps, right? So uh, alpha uh, M plus one, is just the least ordinal alpha such that um, the previous Fn, is related to the thing defined by D alpha um, X by this relation R, right? And then you just pick a real number to witness that, right? And whatever um, uh, next number you pick, um, you just let um, the next choice, the choice at the N plus one step to be, um, that, right? To be that thing, this thing that's said to be related to your previous choice by R. Right, just do this, you just do this recursion omega many steps and use AC to pick the X, the, the, these guys. These guys are picked using AC in V because basically you want to choose real numbers. Right? So you want to have a way of making choice of real numbers. Um, so you get this sequence of XNs, but then this is only omega many real numbers. So you could code it as a single real number in a computable fashion. Yeah, well, so let's call that R. Um, and so the dependent choice function that we've defined in V, right, that exists in V, is also definable uh, from ordinals and reals, right? Because now you could define it with R, right? Um, you've basically coded the, the choice of the, 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 your choices of these X ends with R. So now you could just read it off um, what these X ends are, right? And carry out the definition above in the proof, namely the recursive definition of these guys here. And this defines F uh, using 
or, uh, using a single real number R. So this puts it in hot of R. So this dependent choice function that we've constructed in V is actually, right, we've shown uh, lives actually inside hot of R. So hot of R satisfies DC. Okay. Um, and that is all I have prepared for today. Um, hopefully it covers everything, but if not, we'll just do some follow-up and more exercises and whatnot, depending on what, uh, how the course goes um, in the next few days. All right, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And anyone has uh, some, has questions or problem, comment? Is, Uh, uh, Jason, I, I have a question. Could you uh, see uh, more about the D2, D2 power size? Okay, uh, D2, um, yes. So the way to think about this is, so again, second order logic, um, it has, has nice syntax, right? Its formulas are, uh, a finite length and it has a recursive uh, syntax, right? You could tell, you, know, you, 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 could, you could write a computer program that says, that decides whether uh, something is a second order logic formula or not. So that means um, definability in second order logic is definable in set theory. So that gives you basically one direction. Mm. Uh, let me see. So let me call this L2. Okay, I call this L2. So L2 is a subset of hard. Uh, what I said, basically just a, a very informal, very sketchy proof of this. And this is because um, set in second order logic is formalizable. Okay. Um, um, yeah, and, 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 and to get these guys to just say, okay, this is the set defined at the alpha level. So that's where the ordinal parameters come in, right? So every stage of L2 could be definable from ordinal parameter. Okay, and, 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 and this other direction um, is where the second order in its, uh, plays a role. Right, so um, this it, the proof is um, by induction. Right, so suppose you get to some stage. So um, here's the idea: if um, x is um, let's say ordinal definable, right, then um, there exists some alpha such that v alpha thinks you know x is equal to you know this set defined by some ordinal parameters, right? This is just the definition of, of being ordinal definable. And what you do next is, now you so, assume, uh, yes. Is, is some, something on your screen, I, at least I, I cannot see the whole screen of your- It's now better? No, it's okay. Okay, I think I had the uh, speaker's view up. Okay, but no, okay, good. Um, so assume inductively that um, mm, X is already a subset of L2. I could do that. Uh, we could pretend that we're in the middle of a, an, a proof by induction. Right now, um, let um, L2 gamma be such that um, X is a subset of L2 gamma. So you wanna to move to a stage, move to a set, I mean, move to a stage in this second order L construction where you could see everything below X. Um, and also, um, so for this V alpha, um, L2 gamma, the cardinality of that is greater than V alpha, the cardinality of V alpha. 
So we want to move to a gamma high enough such that this holds. Right, so um, you could do that, right? Because you can move arbitrarily high. And then you just say L2 gamma is going to define X by saying that there is a relation on L2 gamma uh, that, uh, I don't know, that makes it isomorphic to um, the alpha under the, uh, under the uh, membership relation. And this is where you use second orderness, right? Second order definability is used here, right? You basically say, well, this uh, relation exists, right? Because V alpha is well orderable. So basically say, okay, there is this relation that could make the universe, and maybe not L2 gamma, but you know, something smaller than it. I don't know, but, but you get what I mean. Okay. Some smaller set. That makes it isomorphic to V alpha, and then you run this definition here in V alpha. Yeah, so that's how I do it. Um, and the key point where you use the axiom of choice again is to well order V alpha. So if you don't have AC, you you are not guaranteed that you could make this move. Okay, sir. Um, and there, there's this uh, uh, body of work by uh, Kennedy, Vaminen, and uh, Magador that shows uh, that if you modify second order definability by, if you tweak it a little bit, give it some more exp expressive power, it still doesn't change. So hot could be kind of stable under expressive power. So it could say, okay, second order logic, but then you add it with this or that uh, generalized quantifier, but you still get hot. But that's, uh, yeah, that's a different body of work. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? So, uh, yeah. So uh, may maybe I have uh, missed, you said you could uh, uh, send the, the handout to us. Um, yes, yes. I can send it to you. Uh, okay, you can to me. And uh, we, 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 we plan to put it on our website, right? Is it okay for you? Yeah, yes. Uh, I might have to go back and fix the typos, but yeah, yeah otherwise, okay. yeah. Okay. okay. Do you want the one, do people want the ones with the uh, messy handwriting on or, <laughs> or just a okay. clean copy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think maybe, yeah, it's a clean copy is okay because we yeah. have uh, we have recorded the, your yep. lecture, and uh, maybe we we will we plan to put on the B B D B D. Okay, good. So yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'll take a few hours to fix the typos, and uh, I'll I'll send it to you. Yep. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very, 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 very nice. Right. So see now see maybe see you. See see you a couple of hours later. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okie dokie. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.